we'll be covering the launch vehicles and spacecraft parts and the fitter modes that are associated with launch vehicles and spacecraft. And we'll continue our coverage of um, why we're doing this, because I think it's important to kind of step back and look at the reasons why we're trying to study uh, this material. Uh, these are interesting examples of a fuselage skin of an aircraft, uh, which in this case has exhibited a buckling behavior. You can see that on the skin. It looks like a, a significant amount of uh, shear loading that has occurred and it has wrinkled the skin. So this, this type of behavior uh, is common. You can see here the bottom Delta vehicle uh, had a, has a skin that's also buckled. This wrinkling of the skin occurs when you have loading environments that are shear and you expect shear. And I'll be discussing that a little bit later when we do free body diagrams of airplanes. But in this scenario, the tail exerted a downward force uh, and that's because of the weight considerations and also the lift reacted on the empanages. And so that creates a compressive load in the bottom surface while you have a tension load in the top surface. The compressive loads then cause a shear behavior that shows as wrinkles. Uh, this is a military aircraft at the very top and you can see the wrinkling behavior on the surfaces. A buckling behavior does not always have to be catastrophic. It can be such that the aircraft does not fail in service. However, this buckling behavior, if it's a metal, can cause plasticity, yielding, and other behaviors that could then lead to other failure scenarios. If it was a composite structure that had experienced this type of buckling behavior, then those composite structures can then exhibit other failure modes as, as discussed last week, such as fiber failure, matrix cracking, delamination, and so forth. It, it is very important that we understand the spacecraft and launch vehicle parts and why and how we design these parts um, against the failure modes they may experience in service. And so that's what I'll be covering today is, is again, making progress towards understanding spacecraft and launch vehicle parts. So stepping back again, the goal that we have for this course is to ensure the structural integrity of aerospace vehicles and making sure that their structural integrity is maintained through all the phases in flight over the whole planned service life. Structural assessments can be quite challenging, and we discussed that in the previous lecture. The design and fitter modes can be quite complex. Uh, we also design to very low margins of safety, uh, and we have to do that because of weight considerations. We have to design structures so that they can survive the launch and ascent environments, and those environments are not simple. And then to top it off, the hardware that's built is going to be imperfect. It's going to have uh, defects in the hardware. For example, you could have FOD, you could have thicknesses that do not match the drawings and all that is actually quite common. Um, low material properties, the drawing tolerance, tolerance has may not be met. And so that's why for us in this course, it requires for us to develop a fundamental understanding of the primary structural components, their functions and failure modes, so we can then better, when we design them, understand what to design them against. So in the previous lecture, we covered failure, failure mode. In this lecture, we're trying to understand the components for launch vehicles and spacecraft and against what failure modes we should be designing. So what are the system failure modes that were discussed? We covered distortions, bolted bonded joints, buckling and crippling. So these are system level failure modes and there are many more, but these are the ones I'm kind of summarizing today. We also have the metal failure modes and that's creep, strength, 
fatigue, fatigue fracture, excessive yielding. And then we also have those that have chemical interactions like corrosion and embrittlement. Composite failure modes that were discussed uh, in the previous lecture were fiber failure, matrix cracking, so the resin material that's impregnated into the composite um, that hold the fibers together, those matrices can start cracking. And when the matrix cracks, it can form into a bigger crack, which can lead to delamination or it could lead to fiber failure. Not all matrix cracking is detrimental, but some of them are. Core failure modes like shear failure, core crushing or core cracks can also impact the structures. And sandwich structures are quite used in the applications for launch vehicles and spacecraft, including aircraft as well. Although today I'm not covered, covering the aircraft parts. The sources of, 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 for these failure modes can be manufacturing errors, impact damage, carelessness, and excessive loads. So these are the topics that were already covered and it's important that you gain a fundamental understanding of everything and anything that can go wrong. Because what we want to do is protect these structures against these failure modes. And you can't do that if you don't know what the failure modes are and you don't know what the parts is supposed to do. So let's cover first, what are the parts in a launch vehicle? So I'm showing three different designs here uh, from different applications. We have a launch vehicle on the left-hand side. We have one here in the middle, and then we have one on the right. And this all comes from open source. Um, nothing here in this lecture is proprietary. All this comes from open source materials. And so I can use this to kind of teach you the parts that are um, that make up the launch vehicle. Let me start uh, with the middle picture and then I'll move to the left and the right one to kind of show you that different launch vehicle designs have the same general features. Here is a launch vehicle design that came, out, came from the ULA launch um, providers website. And what you see here is a person being shown so you can see the scale of a launch vehicle which can span 250 feet to, to, to even higher heights. Um, pretty launch vehicle, you know, pretty long launch vehicle um, with diameters that can be quite small compared to the land. Here what you see is the first stage engine. Uh, the first stage engine provides the thrust required um, to propel the launch vehicle from the ground and we usually use several stages and this is done for uh, optimization and I'll be showing that a little bit later in, in, in a later lecture. Uh, and the second stage is then used to then propel you to space. You could even have a third stage. The first stage is discarded once it's used. The second stage now then is used. And the nice thing about the second stage without the first stage is that you have discarded weight that is not needed. Uh, so many designs could have even up to three stages. Here on the left hand side, you can see that you have the first stage, the second stage, and then a third stage. And the ability to have stages or how many stages you want to have depends on the design and the parameters uh, of uh, orbit insertion, uh, how much weight you want to carry, and, and so forth. So a first stage engine um, usually is a liquid rocket engine. It doesn't have to be a liquid rocket engine. It could be a side rocket motor. Uh, but the picture I'm showing here is a um, liquid rocket engine. You could also have a thermal shield and the thermal shield is there to protect hardware from getting hot, particularly because your engine is just right here. You then could have uh, a stage tank. In this case, you have a fuel tank and an oxidizer tank. The oxidizer tank and fuel tank not only carry the primary loads of the vehicle, they also carry, pre they're pressurized. And they also provide the fluids 
for the engine to then produce a thrust that's required to fly. These tanks are usually pressurized to provide stability because imagine having a very thin can uh, of Coke. If you had a thin can of Coke and you stepped on that thin, a thin can of Coke, the thin can of Coke will buckle. So very similarly under flight conditions, these tanks could buckle because you're going to have large compressive, compressive loads during ascent, which can, could cause these things to buckle. So the pressurization in the tanks then allow providing that stabilization. And then you will, you will also have a series of valves and plumbing that sends, that, that's able to then uh, allow the oxidizer fluid and the fuel fluid to travel to the engine where the combustion occurs. You're also going to have for the second stage, stage engine, uh, something very similar. You're going to have um, a oxidizer tank, a fuel tank, and these fluids together provide uh, the, com the, the components necessary for combustion in the, in the engine. In this case, what I'm depicting is the Arlton engine because that's what the ULA launch website had shown. Um, once you have these tanks together, um, you're also going to have intertanks. So example here, you see a separation between the oxidizer tank and fuel tank. This intertank provides space. So we have also the intertanks which provide the space between the first stage oxidizer tank and the first stage fuel tank and the interstage provides space um, basically uh, to then you could have avionics components there, you could have electronic boxes, you could have other pressure vessels in there that provide the pressure for the tanks as an example. Here you have an interstage adapter that provides separation between the first stage and second stage and that's why it's called an interstage because interstage means inter, inter between stage. That's what that means. In this case the interstage is not fully cylindrical um, and then you have the payload attached feeding. The payload attached feeding we'll have a spacecraft attached to the payload attached fitting, which is then also attached to the payload fairing. And the payload fairing is attached to the stage tanks. What the payload fairing is really doing is protecting the spacecraft from the environments it is going to experience in service uh, and dur during ascent, I meant. So this is your uh, basic launch vehicle design. On the right-hand side, you can see the Orion's vehicle. Um, in the Ryan's vehicle, very similar uh, features can be found. You can find um, a, a stage tanks, you're going to find uh, bulkheads, you're going to find a payload adapter, uh, and then you're going to find um, the spacecraft with the fairing. Um, protecting the spacecraft. Another aspect of designs that could be used is a solid rocket motor. Solid rocket motors are used to provide additional thrust during the initial ascent. And the solid rocket motors, usually they will last two to three minutes or one minute to three minutes. And the purpose is to give you that thrust and once they're expanded, they can be jettisoned and those solid rocket motors are no longer needed. In the design on the left, this is more similar to a Delta II vehicle. It used up to nine solid rocket motors. So you could have a lot of solid rocket motors. You could have two, you could have five. In the Orion configuration here, you see two. Um, but again, basic features are basically the same. Um, so launch vehicle designs typically will have the same types of components. You can have small bottles, uh, hydrazine bottles in this case, you're gonna have um, uh, raceway covers and raceways and cork and other com primary components and secondary components that I may not have covered. And so what you see here is a picture of a Centaur D1. 
uh, courtesy of Lockheed Martin. It's a NASA historical reference collection. And you can see here uh, other components you can have in much more detail. For example, here you can see the LOX tank, the, LO2, the liquid oxygen tank um, in this case. You have the main engines in this case. You have the uh, you have bottles as well, small pressurized bottles like helium bottles. Um, you'll have a thrust uh, barrel, uh, intermediate bulkheads, and a lot of these tanks are going to have these slosh baffles. This, these baffles uh, are not meant to be structural, they're meant to prevent sloshing from happening. Here you see a liquid hydrogen tank, and then you can see an adapter. Uh, you can also have a lot of guidance and control, um, for example. Uh, just give me a second, guys. I'm having some trouble. So, so designs really evolve from failures. Uh, anytime a launch vehicle experiences an anomaly or a spacecraft, it's an opportunity that we have for learning. And that was the case with the center upper stage rocket um, during its maiden voyage in May 1962. Um, it exploded, exploded 54 seconds after launch and it engulfed the rocket into a huge fireball. And the investigation at the time revealed that center's light stainless steel tank had split open and it spilled its liquid hydrogen fuel down its sides where the flame of the rocket exhaust ignited it. The loss of Centaur was regarded as a serious setback back in the day for NASA and any launch vehicle or spacecraft that experienced an anomaly or a failure uh, definitely results in a setback. But there also are opportunities for learning uh, and they do represent a, a great opportunity for learning. During the federal investigation, it was declared that trying to tame the liquid hydrogen to the point where expensive operational space missions can be committed to it has turned out to be more difficult than anyone had supposed at the outset. The center depended on pressure to keep its paper thin stainless steel shell from collapsing, and it did that by inflating the propellants. Uh, with propellant so that no internal structure had to give strength and stability. Uh, visualize this with me. Visualize a balloon. A balloon without pressure is flimsy. You apply pressure and now the balloon has a structure to it, uh, a round structure to it, um, and it can support some load. Very similarly, the center was quite thin to the point that it could collapse without the pressure. And so, um, in this case, pressure is given the strength and stability. And, you know, these structures, for that reason, were called pressure stabilized structures. Um, and today's launch vehicle designs, pressure is used as a stabilizer. It stabilizes the structure so it doesn't buckle. But, the so-called pressure-stabilized structure of the Centaur, when coupled with the light weight of its high-energetic prior propellants, made the Centaur lighter and more powerful than upper stages that used a conventional fuel. But at the time, critics argue that it will, it will never become reliable. However, that is a step in the design evolution, because this technology, it is used today, where you do have thin designs for the walls of the cylinders and structures and pressure is used to help uh, and prevent the structure from collapsing. So ve very important to, to keep in mind that that technology is used today. Well, the function of a payload, let's look at the payload. The payload sits at the very top of the launch vehicle uh, structure and the, the payload's uh, purpose, the main purpose of that payload is to protect the payload fairing. The main purpose of the payload fairing is to protect the payload from aerodynamic loads and environments. And it allows for separation of the spacecraft. And this needs to occur very carefully because if during separation, a part of the fairing 
comes into contact with the spacecraft, you could damage it. So very important to consider that the fairing is a very sensitive structure, is going to see aerodynamic loads that could be significant, and that it does have critical function of protecting that spacecraft from any damage from the environment as it's ascending to space. Particularly contamination. Contamination can be a key problem for spacecraft. And so to keep the instruments and everything clean, you got to maintain good contamination controls in that fairing. The payload fairings is really designed for air loads. It's going to have differential pressures across a uh, composite. And then it's going to have separation loads. Uh, so the fairing uh, has to survive in number of loading environments that are not quite simple to address. There are key failure modes uh, that need to be addressed, such as stability, separation, joint strength, tends to be one of the most critical ones. So this, this flange here, uh, in this case, the separation system will cause the two halves to separate. And this came from the ULA website. Uh, contamination of the spacecraft could occur during contamination. That could be a problem. And then you do have, if this structure is made of composites or sandwich or laminated composite, is going to be exposed to the failure modes that were described earlier, like fiber failure, delamination, and things like that. So when you're designing these structures, you ought to make sure that we're designing for these failure modes that have adequate stability and that have adequate separation joint strength to ensure they have an adequate fairing structure. So what is a payload? A payload fairing is a nose cone used to protect the spacecraft against impact of dynamic pressure and the aerodynamic heating. There will be significant amount of aerodynamic heating during ascent as a, as, as a launch transverse the atmosphere. An additional function on some flights is to then maintain a clean room environment for precision instruments. And that's extremely crucial as I discussed earlier. Once outside the atmosphere, the fairing can then be jettisoned and then you can expose the payload to the outer space. The payload fairing is typically a cone cylinder combination and that is done due to aerodynamic considerations. The fairing usually separates into two halves upon jettison, and for that reason it's called a clamshell fairing. You may hear that term in industry um, by way of analogy to a bifurcating shell of a clam. If the payload is attached um, both to the booster score structure and to the fairing, the payload may still be affected by the fairing bending loads as well as inertia loads due to vibrations caused by gusts and buffeting. So let's look at uh, the payload fairing further. There's an article called the Composite Load Fairing Structural Ar Architecture Assessment and Selection. And this research paper examines a fairing. And I think it's a worthwhile article to study. Once a launch vehicle obtains enough altitude, in those cases, obviously, the atmosphere becomes less dense. And as a consequence, you don't have the aerodynamic forces anymore that are required to protect the spacecraft. And you don't have those high heating environments. So the fairing, as it's ascending to space and it transverses the atmosphere, is going to be exposed to high heating environments as well. So not just pressure, but the high heating environment as well. So therefore, fairings um, are used to protect against the heating and aerodynamic uh, application or loading environments. Uh, fairings um, are built um, and, and they're built with these flanges that are longitudinal and they usually separate with pyrotechnic devices. And so that shock from the pyrotechnics can also be a problem. And so you want to design for that as well. Another consideration is the acoustics. You want to design the fairing for 
acoustic loading conditions so that acoustic loads do not damage the spacecraft. Here's an example from that paper. In this case, <coughs> uh, the, the payload typically is going to have an access door, uh, it's going to have a purge inlet, uh, it's going to have separation rails, as we discussed, these are your separation rails in this example, and it's going to have ring frames at top and bottom barrel of the model, it's going to have umbu umbilical cords, uh, umbilical doors for umbilical cords, uh, for many different uh, functionalities. Um, you're also going to have to have uh, access at these areas. You may have multiple access doors as well. So the structural integrity of payloads has to be assessed for a combination of loads, ground, launch, flat environments, inertia loads, aerodynamic loads, vibration, thermal and acoustic loads. Moisture absorption can have a significant impact on the strength and stiffness of the composite sandwich structure. Also, it could have a significant effect on flaws. For example, say I have a flaw in the, on the sandwich structure and that the flaw is between the face sheet and the core. If I have compression loading environments, that face sheet can pop out. You also want to make sure they have proper separation of the launch vehicle and the proper clearances are maintained. You may implement some amount of structural health monitoring and again, acoustic transmissibility to make sure we protect the payload from the harsh acoustic environments during launch ascent. Like I said before, buckling can be a major aerodynamic consideration that should be looked at. Sandwich fader modes can occur due to the aerodynamic loads. And laminate fader modes can occur due to attachment to adjacent structures. So typically you may have a sandwich structure here, a laminate here, and that laminated structure now attaches to stage tanks and things like that. Uh, it could attach to the payload adapter, payload attached feeding, and things like that. And so you, you may have some, la you may have a laminate failure mode um, issue at those critical locations. And here you can see one of the buckling mode shapes at max Q, which is one of the highest aerodynamic loading environments you may see as you're ascending to space. Let's look at the Orion payload fairing, which also consists of two halves um, and whose inside surface are covered with acoustic attenu attenuation panels. And these attenuation panels are there to protect the spacecraft from acoustic damage. The acoustic protection is used to absorb the noise generated by the engines during the liftoff events. The payload fairing has an external diameter, in this case, of 5.4 meters and a total height of 17 meters. It's fairly large in shape, essence, in essence 15 feet by 54 feet. Very large structure that's trying to encompass and enclose the spacecraft. In order to increase the volume available for the spacecraft, sometimes the, the, the cylinder is raised further to then be able to accommodate the bigger payload. Let me show you a separation test uh, from online sources.
Let me cover payload adapters now. Payload adapters generally are of conical shape and they ensure interfaces between the launcher and the spacecraft. And they consist of a conical or cylindrical structure with an upper interface compatible with the spacecraft. A bottom bolted interface is typically used and it could connect to the fairing as well as the adjacent structure. And a separation system, generally a clamp band with springs that will meet the spacecraft separation requirements is used so that you can then deploy the spacecraft using this clamp band. I will go through that. Failure modes in pay for payload adapters uh, are typically separation, buckling, sandwich, and laminate failure modes as well. Here we have the Orion's configuration payload adapter. In the upper position, the spacecraft adapter is composed of two parts, is either composed of two parts. A payload adapt fitting path, we call it path, and you can see the path right here um, or right there. Um, and a launch vehicle adapter or in one single part mounted to the upper interface. In lower positions, the spacecraft adapter is composed of a path, a payload attached feeding. So you can see here you have a payload attached feeding and then you have a, a structure that's keeping the spacecraft attached to it. In the configuration you're seeing here, there are two spacecrafts. So we call this a dual launch configuration, but you could have even a single one uh, if you would like. Here's an example of payload um, adapter. And in this case, the this payload adapter is composed of a carbon structure and two aluminum rings and it comprises of a membrane which separates the satellite compartment from the upper stage. And it is designed to prevent helium transfer uh, upper part compartment to the satellite compartment. So that's why the thin membrane is installed. The spacecraft is typically secured to the adapter interface frame and here you have a clamping device. The clamp band consists of a band with one connecting point typically. And then the tension is applied to the band, so they apply tension to this band to provide pressure on the clamp, which then attaches to the satellite, to the launcher. The release of this clamp band is typically done with a clamp band opening device per technically initiated. Orion's user's manual called a CBOT. It's really designed to generate low shock levels, and it is, is a very nice design. And a set of catchers will then secure a safe behavior and allows the clamp band to, to not cause any damage. Here is a top view. So if I look at the top, from the top down, here I have a view of the clamp band. It's basically a clamp, and you can see that here. And then here you have a, a joint. And in this joint, what we're trying to do here is we're trying to apply pressure to this clamp and then release it with a pyrotechnic device. Here is a side view. So if I were to cut this section here, if I were to cut CC, this is the way it looks. It looks like uh, you have the payload side, payload uh, attached fitting, and then you have the band. Uh, and this plane here is a separation plane. When the clamp band comes apart, then the spacecraft gets released. And here, I have a, a cross-sectional view, finite ele element modeling of a clamp band. And you should be able to search and find a paper written by Goyal, G-O-Y-A-L, in Rome on clamp band modeling. So I'll let you download that and read that. But for now, the important consideration here is to understand the phenomena and the physics, is that this clamp band here basically applies pressure to keep these two sides together. And you can see that here as well. So the clamp band here keeps both of the sides together. And you apply pressure through a torque uh, to tighten that belt, 
and this belt then is broken by the pyrotechnic device. So what are the failure modes that could occur? Is stiction, things are stuck, failure to separate or gapping, meaning if these gaps, if this surface comes apart, then the whole thing comes apart. And so testing is typically done to characterize the behavior of these clamp bands and ensure that I am getting adequate contact so that things are kept together. Here in the y-axis, I'm showing the allowable axial load applied to the structure, and we're checking well, how does that change with preload. You can see here, as the preload increases, the axial allowable, the maximum load I can apply to this clamp band also increases, which is significant and is quite important. Let me show you a video uh, describing the separation behavior. separation from the rocket a separation system is a device that'll let go of a satellite once the final stage of a rocket has burned out if a satellite fails to separate it won't turn on the mission will be a failure that kind of thing of course is completely unacceptable the planetary systems team realized that some of the problems with the older satellite separation technology were inherent to its basic design Traditionally, satellites were attached to rockets via tightly compressed steel bands that were released by pyrotechnic devices that severely shocked the satellites upon separation. With support from the Air Force Small Business Innovation Research, SBIR program, Planetary Systems Corporation developed a lighter weight, lower shock separation system called light band and a small canisterized satellite dispenser or CSD. Between them, Light bands and CSDs increase reliability, reduce liftoff weight, and save money. The big issues with the prior technology is that it was heavy, large, and pyrotechnic. The problem there is they're using a lot of explosives. They're using the equivalent of about a 50 caliber bullet, and they're cutting a bolt that's under about three to 6,000 pounds of tension. What we've done in the past 20 years is advance the technology that was originally conceived during the initial space race in the late 50s and the 60s. We spent the past 20 years making the second generation separation system work pretty well. Both the Castroy satellite dispenser and the light band are our separation systems. Light bands come in a variety of diameters and are designed to hold and release satellites and canisterized satellite dispensers are designed to protect and deploy smaller containerized systems. Additionally, these solutions are easily tested. Where we make a really big difference is saving weight and volume and increasing the reliability of something they have to have in every one of those space systems they gotta separate. Competitive designs which use pyrotechnics might be able to test once per day, but because they're explosive and because explosive detonation is so damaging to mechanisms. They might, not, they might not be able to test more than 10 times before they have to simply uh, discard the flight article. So we have a very testable system that can be tested thousands of times. When the rocket's taking off and uh, vibrating and launching up into orbit, and then once it's in orbit, it goes through temperature extremes, whether it's in the sun or in the shadows. So we'll do vibration testing, and then we'll do shock testing, which is pretty rigorous. And then we'll do thermal vacuum testing, which eliminates all the air, it has a partial vacuum, simulates space as close as we can get, and then we'll thermal cycle it hot and cold several times. So that's also very rigorous for our mechanisms. And the uh, last thing we'll do is separation testing, so that we have very high confidence that it's going to function properly in orbit. In addition to significantly increased reliability, light bands and CSDs are extremely cost effective. Our customers are saving about $160,000 per separation event. And that savings is coming from two areas. The first area is in the weight savings. Our separation systems are about 10 pounds lighter than other technologies. And launch costs are about $10,000 per pound on the low end. 
Roughly speaking, we save about $60,000 in testing and about $100,000 in launch costs. That's about $160K per separation system. So a pretty good bargain for a lot of folks. The relationship between us and the uh, Air Force SBIR program has been excellent. What the Air Force gave us through the whole SBIR process was funding, which was critical. They gave us access to space flight so we could get flight heritage, and then they lent their expertise in some of the advanced testing. The win-win benefit was that the Air Force was able to get this canisterized satellite dispenser, which they were able to put their payload in and fly on their rocket. And then us, Planetary Systems Corporation, as a small company, was able to develop it into a commercial product that many, many companies have since used. Our customers include NASA. We sell a lot of separation systems to people that work in and for the Department of Defense. Companies like Lockheed and Boeing. We do a lot of work for the commercial companies like SpaceX. Planetary systems light band and canisterized satellite dispenser technologies. Proven, reliable, successful solutions, all due to and so here we demonstrated that how advancements in separation systems are being made to minimize the impacts of pyrotechnics. pyrotechnics. Interstages provide transition from the top tank uh, of lower stage to bottom tank of the upper stage, and you can see that here, um, and provides transition from fuel to oxidizer tank. The construction of these tanks tends to be composite sandwiches or metals that are stiff stiffened. Other functions that these intertanks can play is they can house electronics, ordnance, and control systems. They also can provide attachment points to solid rocket motors because it could be quite uh, challenging to have solid rocket motors attaching through a pressurized wall like a stage tank. So intertanks are a perfect location where the solid rocket motors could attach to. Their intertanks are designed primarily for air loads and inertia loads, and there's also pressure differential that could occur across the wall. The key failure modes for intertanks include shells that are critical in compression, so buckling, for example, and joints could be critical in tension. Uh, you could also have metallic or composite sandwich failure modes depending upon what, uh, what is a structure being designed with, whether it's metal or composite. So what is going on physically is that aerodynamic loads are acting um, on the vehicle that creates bending and say that the gray portion is the fairing. Well, that portion causes significant amount of bending on the intertank or interstage. And so on one side you will get compression, on one side you will get tension. And in these scenarios, uh, the compression side, which let's say this is the side that's in, on the compression, that side will be buckling sensitive. At another azimuth where you have tension, then is the joints that typically become more sensitive. I recommend that you read a paper called the NASA Ares 5 Heavy Lift Vehicle Structure Analysis and Composite Material Weight Savings. It's a great paper that goes into this, to the lift, uh, heavy lift composite structures for uh, the interstage as an example. So intertanks typically could have, uh, for metallics, strength fader modes, buckling, tension fader at the joints, and here I'm showing you a few joints that you could have. You could have a neutral axis that's maintained with a sandwich structure and a metallic clevis or composite bonded design. Um, and then you also have a neutral axis that tapers down from a composite to a laminate with a clevis design, which could also be metal or composite. And so in either side, in either situation, these structures here, this joint here will be critical in tension. And compression uh, basically drives buckling fader modes that need to be checked. Say for example, I have a 
defect on the lamina on the, or the composite sandwich structure. When this azimuth, say, is under compression, then that delamination can pop out, as an example. In the intertanks, you're also going to have several access doors which allow you to install the electronic boxes and things like that that we talked about. And so you definitely want to pay attention to these stress concentrations because these stress concentrations can drive the design. And you can see here that there is a boundary being uh, drawn, outlined, and that represents that it was probably made thicker near the cutout and then it dropped off from the cutout out. Uh, Intertank designs um, have been considered in the past, many different kinds, uh, bonded hats, integral, integral blade stiffened, honeycomb sandwich structures, reinforced core sandwich structures, integral blade sandwich structures. Regardless, intertanks play a significant role in carrying compression loads and also play a critical functional role in providing the transition between one tank to another while also providing um, and housing electronic boxes, tanks, and things like that. Here's an example of an intertank, inter and in this intertank is semi-conical section or truncated conical section, and those tanks, uh, those intertanks have been used quite extensively. Uh, let's look at now a liquid booster tanks. Uh, liquid booster tanks, uh, in the example on the left, I have a, a aluminum lithium orthogrid tank structure um, that houses the LH2 tank, so it's an LH2, and then you also could have a LOX tank in this design. Uh, and that's a NASA vehicle. You could also have, uh, in this, this picture is nice because it shows many other components. So it shows the helium pressure radiation bottles, uh, which I'll cover later. And this design is interesting, has a common bulkhead. So this, this dome here, so earlier I showed you a dome. Let me show you that. So there's a dome here and a dome here. Now the common bulk head, which is right here, shares that dome between tanks. And that saves t uh, space and allows it to be uh, integral in this matter. Uh, this particular picture also shows a thrust vector control uh, and also shows a composite interstage. So this interstage here attaches to another part. So that's the upper stage. And so this upper stage uh, which is second stage, attaches to the first stage. And the interstage, composite interstage, in this case, houses the upper stage engine in addition to a thrust vector control, um, which is then attached to this, this structure here. Uh, this particular design has a roll control system on the right-hand side. You can see that over here. It could have ulage settling motors, feed line systems, which are running in the exterior, and electronic uh, devices. The upper stage avionics uh, can contain a number of things, uh, guidance and navigation control, command and data handling, pre-flight checkouts, and you could have a number of avionics attached to the um, edge of the cylinder aft skirt avionics, interstage avionics, and thrust cone avionics. So liquid booster tanks, more specifically, they provide storage for fuel and locks to boost the second stage. Uh, they can also provide structural load path for the vehicle second stage. So you can see here in this case, the cylinder um, not only has houses the fuel and the locks but the shell the shell also has to take air load so it is a it also provides structural path and shape to the rocket the construction is metallic structure typically uh, all the composite tanks have been used successfully isogrid or orthogrid composites can be used in the in here, you can see a isogrid structure. 
which has ribs raised above the skin. And that's a view from the inside. And we call this a semi-monocoque design. We then here have at the top a orthogrid design. The orthogrid design also has these rib-like structures are um, raised. These, are de these de tanks are designed for internal pressure and mechanical loads, like air loads, inertia loads, and ground winds. You can imagine this launch vehicle sitting on the pad subject to 20 miles an hour. You'll expect significant amount of bending of the structure because of that. Key failure modes of this type of designs is well lands are buckling critical. Skin and seam weld for, are, are critical for strength failure modes and even fracture. Uh, in these cases, uh, stringers typically carry line loads, uh, which are critical for buckling. And like I said before, these weld lands, uh, which you can see one here, uh, are fracture critical. Here's a New Glenn design taken from the New Glenn payload user's guide. The midsection here contains all propellant tankage, including the forward LH2 tank and an aft LOX tank, and it's separated by a common insulated bulkhead. That's how they went with their design. The tank barrels are orthogrid aluminum construction in their design, and the domes are con constructed from welded aluminum. Here in their design, you can see this is your second stage, your first stage forward module, your first stage mid module, and then the first stage aft module. So that's the convention they're using. Uh, here in their design, they're considering seven engines, B4 engines. Here's your LOX tank, which again shares that dome with the LNG tank here. Then I go now into this area that looks like the interstage and houses two B3U engines and has other potential components inside. So these are interstage in this case. And then you have your LOX tank here, and then your LH2 tank, again, common bulkhead here. And then you got your tank attached to this fairing. Um, and then you can see here the shape of a payload attached fitting. The, they're, again, they're using orthogrid aluminum designs, and they're really designed to take high G loads re uh, realized during reentry because their approach is to recover the launch vehicle. Large aerodynamic strikes on the aft end of the tank give the returning first stage enhanced cross range during descent and landing. Here's a view from the inside and you can see here the Saturn V uh, design here. You can see the baffles and uh, you know some of these baffles prevent some of the issues that have to do with uh, sloshing. You can also see this piping, um, you know, that will also play a key role in uh, transferring fluids to the engine. Here is a SLS, uh, one of the SLS designs. So let's look at the Saturn V vehicle because, you know, it's qu quite extensively studied. Um, the aft interstage mated uh, the stage to the first stage. So uh, you have that aft uh, interstage um, causing that transition. You can see the interstage right here. A cylindrical aft skirt uh, to which was connected to a thrust structure and is a truncated cone uh, was utilized. The engines were mounted to a thrust structure. Um, typically, the engines will be mounted to some sort of thrust or thrust structure, which then transmits the loads from the thrust to the aft skirt. And here you can see the aft skirt as an example. And you can see here uh, a picture of the thrust structure. So the engine is mounted to that, and the interstage houses the engine inside. A liquid uh, oxygen tank here is shown, uh, and a liquid hydrogen tank is shown. Rather than each of these tanks having their own hemispherical bulkheads at both ends, um, and separated by, the, by an intertank structure like we had here. So here there's an intertank structure. 
Um, in this design, they used the common bulkhead idea. The common bulkhead consists of a honeycomb insulation separating the two aluminum sheets, forming the ends of the respective propellant containers. And that insulation was really necessary because you have uh, LH2, you know, at minus 423F from freezing liquid oxygen. And so the common bulkhead, uh, you know, that allowed uh, this common bulkhead idea of sharing that, that dome really helped shorten the stage by about 10 feet and save about four tons of weight. Very important uh, finding with this approach. And then you have the cylindrical for forward skirt here, um, which was then attached to the forward end of the LH2 tank uh, and then transmitted the thrust load to the to the next stage. So liquid booster tanks are quite complicated. They, they have primary, primary failure modes like buckling, weldland failures, bucket buckling. So bucket buckling basically means that these little triangles here uh, or these little rectangles in the orthogrid design, those skins, uh, since they're not supported, could potentially buckle. Uh, and so if you have sufficient amount of bucket buckling, those bucket buckles can then cause a more global buckling event. Tension failure modes of both the connection can occur, occur. Skin tension failure mode. And if you're using composite tank, fiber failures and buckling can be concerned. And then metrics cracking leading to leakage through the wall should be considered. Because if you use a composite tank with fluid inside, any amount of matrix cracking could then allow leakage to happen through the wall. The driving load in this design, are, they're really designed to, to the hoop stress seen during pressure loading due to internal pressure and hydrostatic pressure at maximum flight G loading. We're going to see that later when we do the analysis, but in general, as this launch vehicle is ascending, you're going to have amount of G loads acting on the fluid that's pushing uh, the fluid down. And so that's going to cause an amount of pressure on these structures. Ground winds can also be a problem for these designs, and we'll be looking at that more carefully. Here's a video of a booster tank test. These booster tanks um, are typically tested under um, pressure loads and sometimes external loads. And this load, this pressure that's applied is applied through a fluid, usually water. So it's a hydroburst test in this case, and I want to show the video for that. What a explosive event. Um, let's look at the upper stage now. So the upper stage provides thrust to place a spacecraft into orbit. And the spacecraft, um, that second stage plays a critical role. It usually has a liquid rocket engine and it supports usually a fuel and oxidizer tank in this design. And here you can see a tank and a tank with a some what looks like a thrust structure here and some bottles. You can see some pressurization bottles, uh, a pressurization bottle there, and a lot of uh, electronics attached everywhere. Uh, the construction is heat resistant alloys, ductile materials with, with high fracture toughness and fatigue life. They're designed for launch vehicle induced flight loads and the upper stage thrust loads um, so up here, you, you have to design it for thrust loads and ground winds. The key failure modes are skin rupture, buckling criticality, and fracture critical. You can see here, in this case, uh, an Arlton engine, and this engine is attached to that upper stage. Uh, and this right here, this outer shell is called the nozzle extension. A lot of engine designs have it to increase thrust and performance. And usually they're stowed uh, as one approach, as shown in this picture. So let's look a little bit more at proportion characteristics and how we can achieve thrust. And I'm not going to go into the physics of thrust, but rather the ways we can get that thrust 
what components can produce it, what pheromones we should be watching out for. Liquid propellants uh, usually is one approach that's used for propulsion. We have pump-fed engines, uh, usually used for launch vehicles, large upper stage engines, pressure-fed, small upper stages and spacecraft, monopropellants fuel only, and bipropellant fuel and oxidizer. And then we're going to cover later on solid propellants, launch vehicle, uh, such as space shuttle used it, and usually have fuel and ox in a solid binder. So it's a solid material as a propellant versus a liquid propellant. And then there's this idea of hybrid uh, approach, and I invite you to look into the sounding rockets or the X Prize as, as, as examples of a hybrid approach. And here you have a solid fuel with a liquid oxygen. Let's study some liquid rocket engines and what engines um, have been used for each cycle that we're, we're going to study. We, here we have the gas generator cycle. Uh, it's the simplest and most common. It uses a small amount of fuel and oxidizer. And you can see here in, in blue the oxidizer and in red the fuel. And you take small amounts of each. Uh, which then uh, are put into a gas gener generator, which will then combust. And that will drive the turbine. And again, you're going to have an exhaust, uh, which can be vented through a pipe or a nozzle. And the turbine will then power fuel and oxidizer pumps. And this, in, in turn, then drives the flow. Um, so that's why it's called a cycle. And here you see the fuel uh, going through this valve, uh, also into a thrust chamber, which then causes the thrust to occur. The Saturn V F1 engine cycle uh, was a gas generator cycle. Here in this example, I'm showing the expander cycle. Uh, the most common expander cycle is used by the Pratt & Whitney RL-10 engine. And the fuel in this case is heated by the nozzle. You can see here the fuel comes in and is heated by the nozzle. Because the thrust chamber will get hot, the fuel will get hot. And, so as it, and then that ha will have sufficient energy now that it drives the turbine. The turbine exhaust that comes out of it is fed back into the injector. And that is burned into a thrust chamber with an oxidizer, which is, is being uh, um, energized by this turbine. This oxidizer then, combined with this fuel, will then cause the, the combustion, which causes the thrust to occur. It does have a higher performance than gas generator cycles. Here I want to show the stage combustion um one in this case um the space shuttle main engine used that and you can see here that on the left hand side in this case the fuel and oxidizers are burned in a pre-burner so you can see that is is uh burning here and the combustion products from this drive the turbine the turbine exhaust then which is here right here it's fed into the injector at high pressure. And this is really used for high pressure engines. Uh, you have your oxidizer again being driven by the turbine and then it mixes in the injector, which then you have uh, thrust from there. It is more complex and requires sophisticated, sophisticated turbo machinery. So here's three examples of liquid rocket engines, uh, and I want to just show you the sheer size. This is the F1 engine Saturn V, locks and kerosene, one and a half million thrust, uh, pounds of thrust, and you can see that um, the height is quite significant. And here you see the main engine space shuttle, uh, or the space shuttle main engine SSME, 374,000 pounds of thrust with locks and, and H2, 
And you can see here the size of it as well. And then here you see the RD-170, which is 1.78 million pounds of thrust and uses locks and kerosene. So liquid rocket engines, you can see here, and this was obtained from the NASA website, and I provide the references here. Uh, on the right-hand side, you see an Arlton engine with uh, regeneration cooling. Um, and you can see a lot of the tubing and piping. And the cross-section of this shows the Arlton turbo pump. The function uh, of the engine is to provide the thrust for most of these stages. We cover that. The main engine components that play a crucial role in the engine behavior is rotors, turbo pump, impellers, thrust chamber, and a lot of plumbing. Uh, you also have the injector, which I did not talk about, but is in there. And the construction typically tends to be high, um, high temperature resistant alloys, so heat resistant alloys. Ductile materials, because these materials will see high heating, a lot of loading, and so you want to have high fracture toughness materials, high fatigue life materials, and they're designed really for high temperature, extremely high and low temperatures. Vibration, uh, high RPMs, gimbal and thrust loads. These engines will produce significant amount of vibrations that need to be considered in the design. The key failure modes that we need to watch out for are cracking of rotor blades. We also have temperature induced fatigue failures, strength failures, amongst many others. There could be leakage, there could be valves that mal malfunctioned, there could be fog in the system, there could be a slew of issues with seals, for example. So liquid rocket engines are, are quite complex. They require a lot of expertise. Um, to really enable these engines to work um, correctly and properly. Here I show the J2X engine, which was used in the Ares 1 and Ares 5 program. And here it depicts the nozzle extension, the regeneratively cooled nozzle section, an engine control right here, the gas generator, and the turbo machinery. And then you have these flexible ducts and then you have a pneumatic control, and then you have the hip bonded MCC. And then you have the nozzle extension, which I just covered. This uses a closed expanded cycle. And you have, you have the fuel coming from the tanks, the oxidizers are coming from the, from the tanks. And in this case, you have a, a main oxidizer valve that feeds into the main injector. Note, that I'm going to now use, I have some of this fuel uh, coming through the main fuel valve into the nozzle, and then you have part of that um, now driving the pump. So it's a cycle, of course. And then here you, you, you have the two, the fuel and the oxidizer coming together into the main chamber which uh, then combust and creates the thrust required with this nozzle extension. And, and, and the nozzle extension need to be designed for high temperature applications. So a little more detail, the fuel and oxidizer come in from the stage and are put through pumps to raise the pressure. I mean, that's the whole point of pumps is to raise that pressure. Uh, on the fuel side, the pump discharge routed through the um, main fuel valve, I cover that, to the nozzle and the main combustor chamber cooling jackets. So right, right through here. And the MCC is cooled first and then now the warmer fuel is used to cool the nozzle. Because you don't want to stretch or you break it, that's where this could be useful. Um, but the bottom line is that the closed expander cycle also achieves a significant amount of thrust I didn't cover the OTBV, which is the oxidizer turbine bypass valve, and it's shown here. Uh, and it's a way to control the mixture ratio by moderating the power to the oxidizer turbine. Uh, the turbines are, you know, in this case, are driven by the warm fuel, and I cover that. So this warm fuel here uh, comes in, and the turbines are really uh, energized by that. 
Uh, and then that discharge, the discharge of the turbine then is, is fed through the main injector um, and then the into the combustion zone. The oxidizer pump discharge is plumbed through the main oxidizer valve, and that's shown here. Um, and, and now it has pressure as well because of the turbine uh, running. And in this case, uh, within the MCC now, uh, the propellants are combusted, and the resultant amount of energy causes high velocity combustion products to come out, which then this expulsion of these products through the sonic main combustion chamber throat uh, causes uh, a supersonic uh, flow, which then causes thrust. Liquid rocket engines, uh, there's a various failure modes. I, I invite you to, to download this, this NASA Faculty Fellowship Program uh, document, uh, which looks at the review of failure modes of the F1 engine and propellant systems. Failure modes for liquid rocket engines can cover seal leaks, plumbing failures, turbine thrust chamber cracking, valve failures, combustion instability, nozzle failures, electrical failures, and then the strength failure modes can apply to any of this, but they can cover things like buckling, uh, strength, yielding, fatigue fracture, bolted joint failures, leakage, all the chemical failure modes uh, interactions we talked about, like corrosion, uh, hydrogen embrittlement, and things like that. Now let's watch this video of, of the Arlton engine. rocket engine, power plant for the Centaur and Saturn, is the result of years of research and development. The highest performance engine built in the free world using safe, reliable, and dependable hydrogen. To maintain the high degree of reliability of the RL-10, vital parts are assembled under stringent laboratory conditions. Following a typical engine through its paces, the thrust chamber tubes are installed. After the assembly is placed over a mandrel, the manifold and bands can be attached. Silver wire is laid in for furnace brazing. Placed in a retort, the chamber is ready for the furnace. Once brazed, the chamber undergoes testing to assure trouble-free operation. Liquid nitrogen is forced through the chamber to perform thermal shock tests. Pressurized with gaseous nitrogen, the chamber is checked for leaks. Subassembly is dried out in a special oven. Final chamber 
assembly is completed with the installation of the injector. A special jig is lowered to accurately align the injector. Then the chamber goes for final machining prior to assembly of the complete engine. On the assembly floor, all parts come together. Fuel lines, valves, turbo pumps are brought from clean rooms, assembled, installed, and inspected. Multiple inspections of each component and sub-assembly assures maximum reliability. Ready for action, the completed engine must undergo the test of firing. The RL-10 is made ready for transport to the test site. The operating principle of the RL-10 can best be shown by this simple diagram. Hydrogen at 37 degrees Rankin, minus 423 degrees Fahrenheit, enters through the inlet shutoff valve, passes through the first stage pump into the second stage pump, where it is discharged at 1,000 pounds per square inch. Then it passes through the cooling jacket manifold, through half of the tubes, through the turnaround manifold, back through the long tubes, to the exit manifold and through the venturi into the turbine. At this point, the hydrogen is now gas at 850 pounds per square inch and 350 degrees Rankin, minus 110 degrees Fahrenheit, and provides the power to drive the hydrogen and oxygen pumps. It then goes through the main shutoff valve into the injector and to the combustion chamber. Drawn in through the single stage oxygen pump, Oxygen flows through the inlet valve directly through the mixture ratio control valve into the injector to combine with the hydrogen in the chamber. The engine itself is as simple as the diagram. To demonstrate, hydrogen enters at this point, flows through the first stage pump into the second stage pump, passes through the cooling jacket manifold, down through half the tubes, to the turnaround manifold, up the long tubes, collected at the exit manifold, through the venturi into the turbine, there it provides the power to drive the hydrogen and oxygen pumps, then around the large line, through the main fuel shutoff valve, into the injector, and then to the combustion chamber. On the oxygen side, oxygen flows through the inlet valve through a single stage pump, directly through the mixture ratio control valve into the injector. Arriving at one of the vertical test stands, the RL-10 is installed and made ready for test firing. Base firing conditions will be simulated. A steam injector system lowers the pressure to the near vacuum of Eight, space. Seven, six, Camera's five, on. Good timing four, on. Three. Two, Eight is good. Headshell is good. Zero. On completion of this test firing, the engine will be returned to the manufacturing area for complete disassembly, inspection, and reassembly. Years of experience, research, and development have gone into the design and manufacture of the Pratt & Whitney Aircraft RL-10 rocket engine. The RL-10 has also undergone space condition testing at the NASA Lewis Research Center, where special viewing ports permit continual visual check of space condition firing. Pratt & Whitney Aircraft's around-the-clock development program is helping accelerate the United States space effort. And as we can see here, the liquid rocket engine was demonstrated for the RL-10. Uh, other videos can be shown for the other engine configurations, such as the space shuttle main engine. 
Let's now cover Star Rocket Motors, which we discussed here earlier. As a Star Rocket Motor can provide the additional thrust uh, that may be required during liftoff and during the first two to three minutes of ascent. And so Star Rocket Motors rely on a more controlled explosion of a mixture of substances. Uh, in this case, you have a propellant grain. And here you have a forward skirt. Here you have igniter, as an example. This is your igniter, which ignites the propellant grain. Uh, you have insulation so that when the propellant grain gets hot, the, the metal or the composite case does not blow up. You have the aft skirt. You have this dome here with a nozzle exit cone. And then you have these slots in the grain which provide. Um, uh, some tenoring to the pressure uh, inside the motor case over time. The cylinder of the propellant grain is typically uh, perforated so that when the igniter um, goes off, you have uniform burning of this propellant. There's a lot of failure modes when it comes to side rocket motors, and so we want to examine what that looks like. Typically, the propellant grain is, is a mixture of different materials, and I'll discuss that later. The space transportation uh, system that the shuttle use, it used solid rocket boosters, and it contained an ammonium perchlorate as an oxidizer and aluminum as a fuel. Once a solid rocket motor is ignited, it cannot be turned off. So that's... That's the difference with liquid rocket engines, where with liquid rocket engines, you can, you can shut it down, while with solid rocket motors, you're at the mercy that everything went well. And in this case, the propellant, uh, I want to point out, the propellant is bonded to the insulation, which is bonded to the motor case. So I invite you to pause the video and read this caption and kind of memorize the different components of a rocket motor. So let's look at, at a more, uh, a different picture, and that came from a book. Uh, you have the thrust skirt, and this connects the motor case to the vehicle structure. In this case, it could be the main core vehicle. The motor case uh, it contains the combustion pressure, can be made of, uh, can be made of titanium high strength steels or uh, wound composites, fiber wound composites, and that's your dome right here. So this is a cross section now looking at the side of this 3D view. You have the polar boss. Uh, the polar boss, uh, in this case right here, transfers the, no the nozzle loads. So you're gonna, have, you're gonna have pressure applied to this nozzle. So that will transfer the loads to the motor case through this polar boss. You then have the nozzle assembly. This nozzle as assembly controls expansion of the chamber gases. So here's your igniter. And as this combustion is occurring, these exhaust gases come out of here. Um, and it controls expansion of these chamber gases in here. The key parameters here are the expansion ratio, the cone angle, throat area, and exit area. That, that plays a critical role into what's going on. The thrust vector control, you could have a thrust vector control that will con vary the nozzle angle. So you could have a nozzle that can actually move um, sideways. Typically, high temperature materials will be used for the nozzle. And it, the idea there is to minimize the heat uh, so that you don't have a burn through. Because if you use, say, a metal for this, then as this is heating, heating, it can burn through the metal. And so the materials you see here tend to be high temperature materials that can take the heat. Uh, typical materials used is carbon phenolic, silica phenolic, or carbon carbon. Here you have the internal insulation, and that internal insulation protects the motor case from high propellant temperatures. Typically, these internal insulation materials tend to be of low thermal conductivity for a reason. Uh, it also reduces heat transfer to the motor structure, and you also have an ablative material uh, sometimes as used to dissipate heat. 
The nozzles typically also have an ablative material. You also have the port or bore. So this, this right here in gray is a propellant, and then this is your bore, and this right here provides the propellant surface area for combustion to occur. More surface area drives up the chamber pressure and thrust level. So motor can have any number of ports depending on thrust and pressure requirements. The port ship that we have here determines burn surface area over the burn duration. I'll show you a picture of that later. Typical ships we're going to see later are stars, and that's because they can increase that surface area we were talking about. And you can also then have cylinders with transverse slots. I'll show that later. The propellant grain here contains granular fuel and oxidizer in a rubber matrix binder. Uh, like I said before, a in this case, the luminal serves as a fuel. The typical oxidizers are ammonium, ammonium perchlorate or ammonium nitrate. You also have fuels as metal powders as, uh, such as aluminum. And they use a binder to keep everything together. And then igniter is what provides enough energy to start the whole solid propellant combustion process. So once you go with the igniter, you basically are go for the rest of the ride. And so you want to make sure the motor case doesn't break up, the nozzle stays integral, that to protect this joint, because you, you may, you're going to have these hot gases, you don't want these hot gases to escape um, this, this uh, joint, because otherwise you're going to have failure. So also you have to have really good joint design. And you also want to have a propellant design that does not break up. So a side rocket motor, it provides additional thrust at liftoff. Here's a picture from, um, from a website. Uh, it shows, in this design, it shows the, the igniter. You can see literally the igniter there, a forward attachment where it attaches to the core vehicle. A graphite epoxy motor case, in this case, a solid propellant, and an insulator. And then you have the aft attachment, which attaches to the core, and a carbon phenolic nozzle. The SRB primary components, I just already covered it. Uh, oil rings, I didn't cover. That's usually used at joints to prevent leakage or the gas escaping. The SRB is designed for intense heat pressure, thrust, flow separations, gimbal loads, and storage. Pre, a lot of consideration in the design needs to be taken there. Key failure modes are failure of the nozzle, metal fracture, motor case strength rupture, and propellant cracking. The design is typically verified through a series of tests. You want to test the motor case to make sure you can take the load, the pressure that's inside that. And also you want to make sure they can fire correctly through a static fire is called. Here's an example of uh, a case burst test of a solar rocket motor composite. And so now I'm going to move on to, this, to a static fire test to demonstrate the behavior of the side rocket motor when it's fired.
So what I've shown you there is the behavior um, or the testing, um, both composite burst test and a static fire. And what we're looking for static fire, we're looking at to ensuring that the nozzle uh, has good, good behavior after the test. We want to make sure that we got the right performance out of the motor case and that everything worked out well, include, including the thrust vector actuators is commanded. Um, everything is checked out to make sure uh, the performance is good, the motor case is intact, and everything has worked well. Here's another picture that shows the igniter, uh, the motor case, the internal insulation that protects the motor case from the hot gases, and then you have the nozzle lexicon and the thrust vector actuator which can actuate this nozzle. Here's another view of additional examples. You have the Titan 4 motor from a book and the schematic gym motor from courtesy of a book also. And all these and the previous videos also came from YouTube, which I have shown the reference later. Um, but again, uh, no scone, uh, insulator uh, here between the propellant and the motor case, a pyrogen igniter. Uh, you also have the nozzle, in this case a, a steel shell, and a carbon, phenol carbon phenolics insulators inside, and then you have the graphite composite in here. Uh, and the Titan 4 motors, very something very simple and similar. You have a nozzle extension, a heat shield, a, th a thrust vector control, you have aft skirt support system, an aft staging rocket fairing, a center segment, a forward closure, and a forward staging rocket fairing. And you can see all the parts here uh, that make up that side rocket motor. So side rocket motors, analysis of combustion chamber environment. Uh, you have the stagnation temperature, the stagnation pressure, and propellant gases. Uh, selection of the insulation material, uh, basically the material thickness, needs to be determined for various areas of the motor case to make sure uh, you can protect it for heating environment. The cylindrical portion of the motor case is expected to ex be exposed to hot combustion gases at the end of the burn and is going to be exposed to high pressure. So you have to design for that. The nozzle and insulation design, the, the throat area is determined by the desired stagnation pressure and thrust level. The expansion ratio is determined by the ambient pressure or pressure range to allow maximum efficiency. And then you have the major difference for side rocket nozzles, which is the technique used for cooling. And ablation and erosion char are a few of the ideas used. Fiber reinforced material used in and near the no nozzle throat can include carbon, graphite, silica, and phenolic. An igniter is also used. You have an initiator, uh, using a pyrotechnic element that converts electrical impulse into a chemical reaction, and then a booster charge and the main charge. A main charge has a, sour, a small solar rocket motor that ignites the propellant grain, and they will burn very for very little time, but it's sufficient then to burn the the cause this uh, motor propellant uh, grain to burn. The propellant grain by itself is a solid mixture. Uh, it contains oxidizer crystals and powered fuel. They're held together in a matrix of synthetic ru rubber binder, less hazardous to manufacture and the handler. Uh, the fuel tends to be 5 to 22% powered aluminum, oxidizer between 65 to 70% amo ammonium perchlorate, a binder that ranges from 8 to 14%, and additives that promote the curing, the bonding, better aging, and reduce cracking. Here's what I was talking about earlier when I talked about the design of the propellant grain towards the aft end. Depending upon how you, you design that, you can get the thrust to behave differently versus time. 
And so various designs exist to like a star shape, uh, star shapes, double anchor, rod and tube, and tubular that can produce various thrust versus time uh, um, behaviors. And here's even more example of side rocket motor grain designs, uh, grains cross-sectional geometries that have been considered in the design of side rocket motors. By altering the grain design, we can achieve progressive or neutral burning, and you can then tailor what you want. And again, side rocket motor designs can have uh, sections together, and and uh, you know the, you will, again different designs for each of those. And you can see here a case bonded design, uh, cono kill, uh, fino seal, uh, like with a star towards the end. So different designs give you different performance. Sour rocket full motor fader modes, composite fader modes of the filament wound case or metal case, buckling. Both of the bonded joint connections and including leakage. So I want to look at I want you to look at the challenger as an example of leakage at a bolted joint design. Propellant uh, failure, nozzle failure, and igniter failure. So nozzle failure comes accompanied with very complex failure modes, delaminations, matrix cracking, fiber failure, pocketing, wedge out. A lot of different failure modes are not very simple to analyze. And so your best course of action is to test and to learn. Pressure vessels and, and composite overwrap pressure vessels are used quite significantly uh, for the purposes of storing fluids that are then used for the rocket operation. Here's an example of a COPV. This came from a NASA website. Uh, here's a 10-pound COPV that can hold 25 pounds of pressurized liquid hydrogen which is quite impressive, very light for what it can do. The launch vehicle stores fluids uh, in composite overwrap pressure vessels. Uh, that was an early, Na you know, an early NASA invention. Uh, like those in the Space Shuttle Endeavour um, orbiter maneuvering system. A Cimarron composite version of this technology called the Jupiter passed Rigorous testing mandated by the U.S. Department of Transportation for certification to travel on U.S. roads. These COPVs or compro composite overwrap pressure vessels, and it's called composite overwrap because it's a composite overwrap pressure vessel, um, carries liquids and gases under pressure. The higher the pressure, the more the tank has to hold, obviously. A lot of these composite overwrap pressure vessels are lined with an aluminum liner. The failure modes of this, and the liner in this case, which is a, a metallic liner, uh, prevents fluids from escaping, so it's a leakage barrier. Uh, and also you could have more of a polymeric uh, behavior that prevents leak from occurring. The failure modes are fiber failure, metal liner buckling, so the liner could buckle, uh, metal fracture or well fracture. Failure modes for uh, metallic pressure vessels include metal failure, buckling failure, and weld failures. Let's look at valves. Common vendors, and I invite you to go to these two websites, the moog.com and marota.com, so you can learn more about valves. But in general, these valves can, can help with the operation of the rocket by opening and closing, and basically serving as a pressure management system and fluid management system, proportion management system. The valves, uh, inlet is isolation valves are sold by Moog, and you can go straight from their website and you'll find this information, but the valves are used to control fuel and oxidizer to the rocket engine. The inlet insulation isolation valves support storable and cryogenic propellant systems. You also have valve actuators. The valve actuator is one that's used to open and close different valves on the engine while allowing precision control over the flow rate of these valves. Moog ha can produce pneumatic, hydraulic, and electromechanical actuators for storable and cryogenic engine control valves. 
You also have high pressure valves. The high pressure valves are electromechanically actuated with various configurations. And here I show an inlet isolation valve uh, and a valve actuator. You also have the fill and drain valve. The service valve or fill and drain valve is manually operated and it directs uh, the acting device and it allows it for pressure or propellant servicing. You also have the regulators. The regulators are used to control propellant feed, system pressure on a launch vehicle. And, and then you have the high pressure valves which are electromechanically actuated with various configuration. You also have the latch valve. The latch valve or isolation valve is a torque motor actuated device that remains in either the open or closed position without power. And it commands the appropriate uh, changes to the valve position. A mechanical micro switch can then be used to determine the valve poppet and armature position. What are the failure modes? They're quite extensive. You can have leakage, structural failure, material compatibility with working fluid. And I invite you to look at this lesson learned at NASA, lesson number 752. You also have contamination and fog preventing clean opening and closing. You can have impact stress failure where the loads are applied suddenly and with a finite velocity produce much greater stresses than if applied gradually. The impact force between the seat and the poppet produces major stress in the solenoid valve. I invite you to pause the video and download this particular set of notes so you can study more about this. Uh, valves are also subject to vibration failures, a stiction where things are stuck, open or closed. Um, and I also invite you to go and study proportion system failures uh, in this particular book. So again, you can pause the video and download these resources. Other pressurized components include bellows, flex hoses, lines and fittings. And we also have failure modes. Typically, fatigue sensitivity becomes a problem. Here's examples of a bellows where bellows are typically used um, in launch vehicle design. And they're used to be able to uh, allow flexibility in lines because lines want to vibrate. They want excessively deform due to the high heating maybe, due to vibration, displacement, heat expansion. And so bellows allow accommodating those deflections. You can see that here, I have a tubing and then the, these bellows can allow things to be more flexible, inducing less stress in the piping. And so that's, that's a good idea, but bellows also comes with their own problems. Secondary structures. Secondary structures are small trusses. Secondary structures are those structures that do not carry the primary loads of the vehicle. You can have small trusses, equipment shelves, brackets, mounting fixtures. And the construction tends to be, again, heat resistant alloy, and they're not designed to take primary aerodynamic and inertial loads. And the driving loading environments tends to be acceleration and vibration.